won't forget again my appetite, my sin. So please, enough. So welcome back to Honored Mad Men. I hope everybody's been well. Today we're probably going to have one of our uh, micro doses of some good old fashioned Elden Ring lore. Today we're going to be talking about America's quote unquote half brother, Malekith, and whether or not he was a failure or betrayed. So as America came into power as the Erdtree's Empyrean, the many wolves and beasts that followed her were granted intelligence by the greater will in the form of opposable fingers. Malekith himself was either one of her original beast companions before he was, uh, you know, granted intelligence, or he was created specifically for America to be her muscle in her struggles against people like the Glomide Queen who she immediately ordered Malekith to destroy. And like the good dog he is, Malekith obeyed. He basically went to war against her servants, the Godskin Apostles, who she might have birthed out of a bizarre union or ritual with a giant serpent who lived in lava. But yeah, he slaughtered scores of them, sealed them away at Faramazula, everybody's favorite sky city, and he also managed to seal away the Glomide Queen's greatest weapon, the Black Flame. It's believed to have possessed the Rune of Death way back in the day, that's why it was so powerful and could kill gods. But after Malekith defeated the Queen and sealed away the flame, it still existed but was greatly weakened and lost its ability to slay gods. He also appears to have bound a couple of Godskin Apostles and Godskin Nobles to Faramazula as some sort of unwilling defenders, which I thought was pretty cool. Now for all of his success, Malekith was now charged with guarding death. I definitely think it's also possible that the Glomide Queen technically was the Rune of Death in some way, personified, or she possessed it. And I think whatever was left of her after being sealed away or killed was repurposed and turned into Melina, and given her goal and purpose for the Lands Between. I mean, think about it. Fire, death, not only that, but a special fire that can burn away, you know, just about anything, even gods. But I'm getting off topic on my short lore video. Anyway. So Malekith fortified Faramazula, he had dragons, he had beastmen, he had unwilling godskin apostles and nobles press ganged into service. It was pretty defended, and it sort of remained that way until the events leading up to the infamous Night of Black Knives. Now we don't really know the specifics, but we do know that Rani or Rykard or both of them or agents in their employ had something to do with this mysterious theft of the Rune of Death. And of course, because the agents were of the same race as Merica and were believed to have had close ties with the Eternal Goddess herself, some have gone on to believe that she had a hand in this conspiracy, even though it resulted in the death of her only non-mutated son, Godwin. Well, legitimate one, that is. All those mausoleums we see around the Lands Between are actually her bastards, but I guess that's unrelated here. Now, Malekith would be punished pretty harshly for his inability to protect the Rune of Death. And to be fair, the Knight of Black Knives definitely did have some pretty dire consequences for the Lands Between, and definitely not because a couple demigods died. Basically, when Godwin was killed, they carved the curse mark into his back, and because this ran concurrent with Rani carving the mark into her own body, successfully killing her body but not killing her soul and allowing her to live in a disembodied state. This had the opposite effect on Godwin. Now this could have been the cost of her ritual, which makes sense and would remind me of some old school witch lore, or it was an unintended side effect that Rani didn't account for, which kind of makes her look a little dumb. I don't think that's the case though. What I am wondering though is whether or not Rani helped. The evidence is sort of tenuous at best, and it mainly hinges on the fact that Rani and Merica may have been plotting together because the Black Knife assassins are all said to be Newman women. And of course, they're close ties to Merica herself. Maybe I'm forgetting some evidence, and it's really nice headcanon. It's my headcanon. I think she did assist Rani. I can't really tell to what end. But if true, it makes her punishment of Malika seem quite harsh. Because it's not his fault that they chose to bury Godwin at the roots of the Great Tree, causing his death blight infested body to spread its virus all throughout the Great Tree and all throughout all of the catacombs of the Lands Between. None of this is really Malika's fault. I mean, I guess if he was a better defender of the uh, Rune of Death, then this wouldn't have happened. But it's not really his fault. There was two demigods at the very least plotting and working against him. So Malekith's punishment was to have the Rune of Death sealed in his own body, which of course drove him insane. He was also charged with doing the cleanup duty of the unintended side effects that arose from the irresponsible burial of Godwin. 
Basically, Godwin spread his death blight all throughout the lands between via Death Root, which supposedly contained little bits and fragments of the Rune of Death. Malachus's job then was to consume all the Death Root in the world. This task would extend until there was no more Death Root in the lands between. To this end, he started up an order of undead hunters and brainwashed them all to be fanatics, probably because he's a product of the Golden Order and his harsh punishment had warped the perception of the world at large. He taught them that the undead were a blight on the truth of the Golden Order, something that shouldn't exist and should be stamped out. And as far as he could tell, he wasn't really lying, he's right. Shit, as far as he knows, it all arose from his failure. That's what's been hammered home into his head. The undead are his fault. If he had been more vigilant, they wouldn't be running around and he wouldn't have needed to form this order of fanatics. He even took in two twins who were shunned in their underground and turned them into true killers and knights of the Golden Order. Dudes with a singular purpose to eliminate all of the undead and, well, feed all of the death root to their master, Garank, the new alias that Malekith was going by as the leader of the undead hunters. You can tell a lot about someone based on the nature of the individuals in their service, and that's something I've always liked and found really interesting about Malekith during his days as Garank. He employs the vulgar militia in various places, having even taught them the rare red and black death flame, even though all across the lands between the short were shunned and ridiculed, killed, beaten, basically forced to a point where they all had to band together and form the vulgar militia to protect themselves. I think Malekith respected the initiative and employed them immediately. He also taught beast incantations to a great number of the vulgar militia, which could have either been as payment for their services rendered, or a blessing to make them into more formidable guardians. Probably both. Now Malekith also employs a very unique set of undead hunters, the Brothers D, one of whom I think is likely a mimic tier, but I'll elaborate on that in a later video. So Garank isn't afraid to get his hands dirty and will employ whoever he needs to to rid the world of death root. I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy to defeat them. I burn my decency for someone else's future. I burn my life to make a sunrise that I know I'll never see. The hunters in the vulgar militia weren't the only ones he had under his command. He also had a handful of extremely loyal gargoyles that he dubbed the Black Blade Kindred. And by that I mean he just reprogrammed some of them to serve him and decked them out with some much cooler black corpse wax. Because yeah, I don't think these things are sentient in the way that we think sentience works. So yeah, he had a handful of these extremely tough badasses that were basically tasked with guarding like the the most forbidden of places and well, himself. But it's safe to say they were trusted with pretty important tasks, which is again interesting because gargoyles appear to be sort of like meat golem type creatures. As far as I can tell, they're just pieces of other champions stuck together to create, you know, a very strong warrior, mended together through powerful corpse wax. But Malachus Black Blade Kindred use a black corpse wax instead of the normal gold that the other gargoyles use. Given Malachus' line of work, it is kind of interesting that he's got corpse machines working for him, but it should be noted that those corpse machines already worked for the Golden Order, and they were probably just the first and maybe only resources that he was given by the Golden Order to complete his task. It really does make it seem like Malachus was doing the best he could with what little he had. But the Kindred definitely weren't any slouches. There wasn't much that could take them in a fight. They're extremely fast and agile, and always possess two weapons that they like to alternate between. The cobbled together nature of these beings sort of makes me think that this is where the Golden Lineage got the bright idea to start grafting. Although they probably just learned that from when Godfrey grafted that beast regent to his back, all in an effort to calm himself down. As we can see, a good number of the regular gargoyles are sort of left in disrepair and ruined states, most notably in Landell or the Nameless Eternal City, which is actually beneath Landell. But not the Black Blade Kindred, all of them are in top-notch fighting form. And to the surprise of absolutely no one, Malekith, of course, has imbued their weapons with his red and black death flame. So yeah, this dude's definitely got some pretty brutal fucking henchmen. And at the end of the day, can you even really blame him? Look at the cards he was dealt. But yeah, that's something I just found interesting about Garank. He doesn't care who you are as long as you get the job done. Shit, he's even willing to reward the shunned with abilities that are normally reserved only for the high-ranking bootlickers of the Erd Tree and the Greater Will. But I wanted to keep this one short, so what do you guys think? Do you think Malekith was betrayed by America? I was trying to think of other evidence that there was for that case, but I think it's just a lot of people's theory. There's not really much evidence besides the whole Newman thing. 
But either way, do you think he was betrayed or do you think he was just a failure? He kind of got outplayed and had to suffer the punishment for that. Who knows? Let me know what you guys think in the comments, but as always, I hope this video was entertaining. If you liked it, please like it. If you disliked it, please dislike it. And if you like hearing me rant on and on and on and on, please consider subscribing. It really helps us here at the Honored Mad Men, and by us, I mean me. But without further ado, let's have our outro, shall we? So I got an old video game retrospective coming soon, a couple character focus videos, but most importantly the infamous Radagon video is back under construction after I got sidetracked for a whole week, so that should be done soon. But as always I'll see you guys next time. I guess it really just comes down to whether or not you like skeletons or not, or whether or not you simp for Fia I guess. But I think when it comes to Malekith the game was rigged from the start. America was probably planning her escape and likely, in my opinion at least, created Radagon as a way to have him replace her as the Eternal while she fucked off to wait for Godfrey and his Tarnish to return to stomp out Radagon and the Golden Order. I believe she was probably going to go hide at the Halig Tree. It's possible Mikola even knew about his mother's plans, but I'm kind of getting into baseless speculation here. So as always, you guys have a good one, and I'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.